if you do create an empty institution, grandiose like the United Nations Forum on Forests or Copenhagen Accord, states use it then as an excuse to say, we don't need anything else. We've, we already established something. And so that empty institution then is used as a political tool to neutralize any political pressures for creating meaningful policy at the international level. And that effectively legitimizes the gap in governance or collective inaction on important issues like climate change. Hello, and welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast, Season 2, Global Ecopolitics. This is a podcast for university students tackling some of the big questions in the field of global environmental politics. I'm Ryan Katsrozine from the University of Ottawa, and my co-host for the show is Dr. Peter Andre from Carleton University. And our guest for today is Dr. Radislav Dimitrov, an Associate Professor of International Relations at Western University. And Professor Dimitrov has participated in a variety of United Nations negotiations on the environment since 1999. He's had a formal role on the EU delegation to international climate change talks since 2009. And these are some of the experiences that make Radislav the perfect person to talk to about today's topic, multilateral environmental agreements. So I'm wondering, Peter, can you set up today's episode? Sure. Thanks, Ryan. As you said, our focus today is on multilateral environmental agreements, or MEAs for short. There are dozens of such agreements, mostly negotiated by nation states under the auspices of the United Nations since the Second World War. Though there are also smaller regional agreements too, and some that were established earlier in the last century. They cover a wide variety of environmental issues. MEAs are typically designed to establish rules and regulations for environmental issues that transcend national borders, whether that's concerning the trade in toxic waste or in genetically modified organisms, uh, whether it's about biodiversity protection or the regulation of persistent organic pollutants and climate change. While they govern transboundary issues, most MEAs are intended to establish new norms and practices at the level of the state. And this is where the politics of creating and enforcing them often gets tricky. In today's conversation with Professor Dimitrov, we'll get into a discussion about what MEAs are, how they work or don't, as the case may be. We'll also discuss the idea of a hollow international agreement, which is an idea Professor Dimitrov has written about. This is an MEA that states agree to, but may not have had any real intention of living up to. Professor Dimitrov, welcome to the Ecopolitics Podcast. Thank you, Ryan, Peter. It is very good to be here and have this conversation. Thank you for having me. Well, we're uh, looking forward to this discussion. I wonder if we can start by um, asking you to define these things called multilateral environmental agreements. Tell us a bit about what they are why these negotiated treaties are the main tool for addressing global environmental issues and what difference they make. Multilateral environmental agreements are roughly speaking treaties between states. Most of them are fairly legally binding, but they do vary in terms of how strict the rules are that states undertake. Uh, multilateral environmental agreements can vary from conventions, which are generally very broad framework agreements with, without very specific goals, to protocols, which tend to be very specific. Um, I think that the term really covers a very wide range of agreements among states, and some of them are actually very non-binding, very weak and loose agreements that almost resemble political declarations. Um, I think that what is key really is that um, most of them are negotiated by state governments who continue to be probably the primary actors uh, on the world stage when it comes to environmental policy. And um, we have a very also large number of these agreements. According to the most comprehensive database, Currently, there are 1,300 MEAs that are mul truly multilateral, um, and they cover an enormous range of environmental issues. Um, and in interestingly, many of them 
have been negotiated very recently. The vast majority of existing environmental treaties were negotiated after 1972, when we had the first major global conference on the environment in Stockholm. That's really helpful. And I, I was way off in my introduction when I said there were dozens of these treaties, and you've corrected me pointing out that there's well over a thousand. Um, I've heard and I, I know that there are some treaties that really try and um, uh, regulate a global issue, say like forest depletion. Um, yet, you know, the, the, there's a differential impact in terms of which states have to uh, change practices because of that. And those same states may not feel that they're affected in the same way. Like, can you tell us what's the other side of the story? If, if say on ozone depletion, an international instrument is the obvious choice and there is wide buy-in, when is there less buy-in around a multilateral environmental treaty? Yes. Um, in general, if the transnational characteristic of the problem is weaker, multilateral environmental agreements uh, become less necessary and perhaps less effective. And occasionally you would actually see states trying to discuss internationally issues that really don't absolutely have to be addressed in a multilateral manner. But the component of interdependence is the crucial variable uh, that really necessitates environmental treaties. Now, even if, if the demand is there, um, some problems are much more amenable to multilateral environmental agreements because they're easy to deal with. For example, with ozone depletion, um, the causes of the problem were fairly concentrated and they could be found in particular industries. They didn't involve broad social practices. And so if theoretically it makes it easier to negotiate because governments know, know where the problem is, they know who are the corporate actors that they would have to put under regulation if they go under an international treaty. Um, and indeed, uh, ozone depletion agreements are one of the success stories in global environmental politics. And we have almost perfect compliance with treaties, partly because implementation is relatively easy. It doesn't affect all sectors of society. And also because international transparency is a little bit easier um, because it's somewhat uh, easier for other countries to follow what is happening, let's say, with, with American industry or with Chinese industries producing ozone depletion substances. There are other types of problems that are so much more difficult to tackle internationally because the causes relate to a much broader uh, range of sources, some of which may be industrial, but some of which may relate to how society simply lives and, and does things. Climate change is a classic example of such a particularly malign problem that is complicated for a number of reasons. And one of them is that um, the sources of, of climate change are such a broad range of social activities. Everything that we do really technically contributes to climate change, you know, from energy consumption and production to industrial manufacturing and virtually every sector, um, heating, cooling of residential buildings, transportation, agriculture and food production. And therefore, it, when states approach this topic on the international uh, agenda, they know that they're really negotiating the future of their society. Because if there's to be a meaningful treaty, they really have to change everything that their society does. Um, it makes it very, very difficult. And an additional reason why climate has been particularly tough to negotiate internationally is because monitoring compliance is a lot more complicated um, and pr providing that international transparency to state actions is also more difficult. Radoslav, I'm wondering if I can ask you about effectiveness of environmental agreements. Um, you know, it's often been observed that these multilateral environmental agreements don't have any teeth, quote unquote. Um, you know, and if we compare this to something like a trade agreement where, you know, if the states don't adhere to agreements, uh, you know, this can result in retaliatory measures, you know, sanctioned by the World Trade Organization, for instance, um, and, and various, you know, dispute settlement mechanisms. So 
I'm wondering, you know, do, do we see anything like this in multilateral environmental agreements? Where are the teeth and why don't we have these sort of uh, dispute mechanisms that states can, can turn to if states aren't following what they say they're going to do? When you look at the vast majority of multilateral environmental agreements, they tend to have very weak provisions for ensuring compliance and monitoring implementation. Uh, typically, face, states do not really face any penalties for non-compliance. If a country violates an agreement, let's say the Kyoto Protocol, um, it doesn't face financial sanctions, it doesn't face any political or diplomatic sanctions. The only thing that they will have to do is to take more obligations for the next so-called commitment period after the treaty expires, which is a very hypothetical sort of um, burden that they will have to face in the future. Um, and for that reason, uh, environmental agreements have come under criticism from all sides as being potentially ineffective because they rarely have teeth. Uh, it is just very, very hard to find um, treaties where a country would be penalized by any international body for non-compliance. The Paris Agreement has actually even weaker compliance mechanisms. What is also important to note, however, is that this situation is not unique to the environmental realm. If you look at all of international law in all issue areas, including security, human rights, and uh, political economy, you will see that that is actually very typical for international treaties. Very rarely, we see very you know strong sanctions to punish non-compliance, uh, and those provisions are embedded in very few treaties. By far, international law, including uh, in the environmental arena, uh, relies on self-enforcement. It relies on the honor system and the promises that states have made, assuming that they will keep those promises. Now, this, in theory, sounds very, very weak and unpersuasive. And theoretically and logically, uh, we would expect to see very low compliance. And then a third side of the story is that, empirically, by far, most states comply with most of the multilateral environmental agreements that they create. The level of compliance is very high, it tends to be very high, and that is very puzzling, particularly in conjunction with the fact that there are very weak compliance mechanisms. So to be very blunt, uh, states keep their promises even though they won't suffer any consequences if they don't do it. And that has been one of the academic puzzles. Do you see any potential for change there? Do you, do you, see, do you think there might be... Uh, a multilateral environmental agreement in the future that might be able to leverage some more teeth? I think it's possible to, to think of a hypothetical scenario where an issue like climate change, for example, can be seriously brought into the Security Council. And let's imagine that under pressure of the United States that has been absolutely devastated by climate impacts in the past years, um, the US and other powerful countries may uh, bring climate change back to the uh, global agenda and reframe it as a security issue. And if you see a series of Security Council resolutions that that uh, enshrine it in this new discourse, I think that future negotiations might actually reach for real teeth and, and make uh, violations of future climate law punishable, including by diplomatic sanctions, and in some extreme Hollywood scenario, even military action. But that, is, of course, is hypothetical. Well, hypothetical it, it may be, but it's it's remarkable that um, environmental agreements might go down that path. And, and I think we'll come back to this in a minute when we talk about um, your conception of hollowness in, in international agreements. So we'll get back to this. But I want to ask briefly about the way that environmental agreements are negotiated. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, many or there's an attempt to kind of seek consensus, or there's a negotiation by consensus in many MEAs. And I'm wondering, you know, in your experience, what does working to achieve consensus really mean in practice? How does this take shape 
does this mean that we're always beholden to the lowest common denominator, so to speak? Well, let me take you along to a very specific real situation. In the climate change negotiations for the last, you know, 25 years or so, um, consensus has been an absolute requirement for making any collective decisions at the international level. What that really means is that when, con- when the 193 countries involved negotiate climate agreements, they can only create them by consensus if all of them agree explicitly or implicitly. In round and round after round of negotiations that I have attended, in, including major conferences of the UN, no decision is possible if even a single country imposes the decision. So what that really means is that the consensus requirement gives every single country a veto power over anything, including the completion of treaties. Now, in practice, occasionally that has given tremendous leverage to countries like Bolivia, who in 2010, during a conference that we attended in Cancun, Mexico, um, really used that veto power to block a series of agreements called the Cancun Accords on Climate Change that were actually very substantive with policy elements in it. Um, And nobody could persuade Bolivia to change its mind. Now, in that particular case, the Cancun Accords were nonetheless accepted because they li- everybody really sidelined Bolivia. Uh, but the main problem remains that because of the consensus requirement, agreements tend to be towards the, the least common denominator. Another very good example, just from, from my own experience, um, comes from the negotiations of one of the major climate scientific reports from the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, I attended a conference during which the final version of uh, the report had to be negotiated among country delegations before it is made public globally. And among the thousands of elements of the report that were uh, negotiated was a global map that for the first time in the history of climate science showed the entire world and how water supply and availability is going to be affected as a result of climate change. I remember that at that time, which was in 2007, and the the meeting was in Valencia, Spain, at that time, the scientists were very excited about this map because uh, it was the first time that they actually aggregated data on a global scale to produce it. One country said, we don't think that the map should be part of the report. And that country was was Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia in general has tried everything to to obstruct any kind of discussion on climate change, whether it is science or politics. And the Saudi didn't really have problems with the science behind the map. They simply said, well, we look at if you look at our own region, uh, that is not what scientists tell us is going to happen to Saudi Arabia. So they blocked the inclusion of the map and other countries were absolutely furious because they said this is a very important policy tool that we have to provide to policymakers around the world so that they can plan accordingly. Um, Because the Saudis stuck to their guns, they established a separate negotiation process just on the future of this map, whether it should be part of the report or not. The negotiations lasted for a day and a half. The Saudi didn't change their mind. And as a result of this, the global map was left out. It never saw the light of day. I kept an electronic copy of everything, so I'm able to show it to my students in class. But this map was never never became part of an, of an official IPCC report. And this is just one of many examples that illustrate how even a single government can actually dilute decisions and the output of international negotiations just because the consensus requirement that guides decision-making in the environmental arena at the global level really implies that agreements tend to follow the least common denominator. That's a really great example, uh, Radoslav. And uh, I I just want to make a plug. We have um, interviewed uh, a few different people on our series who have served as Uh, Reporters with the Earth Negotiation Bulletin, which I'm sure you know well, is a reporting service for international environmental negotiations. And uh, for students listening, uh, 
who are doing research projects related to international environmental negotiations. It's great to go on the Earth Negotiations Bulletin website, pick the meeting that you're interested in. I believe the IPCC meetings are there and they're reported on. And you can go into the, uh, it's not quite a transcript, but the summary of what happened in those meetings. And you can search for what Saudi Arabia said, for example. And at least in plenary, they're named by the, the state who and what they say. And it's very interesting to see those negotiating dynamics uh, played out in uh, and reported on through that reporting service. Have you used uh, the Earth Negotiation Bulletin in your own work, Radislav? I use the ENB reports. Um, I think that this, the ENB remains the primary source of information that is publicly available to every citizen uh, on the planet about international environmental discussions, including negotiations of future treaties. Um, and a serious student who wants to do a research paper really must use ENB reports um, as part of their bibliography. Um, it is really a very exciting way to learn day by day what country said what uh, during the negotiations on any particular environmental issue. Uh, in addition, their website includes very exciting photographs and sometimes even videos from the negotiations. So it's really great. I also feel that you know many um, observers feel that over the years, the ENB reports have evolved and they've changed their character where they've become very kind of dense and it makes it a little bit more difficult for some citizens who are not well informed about the issues involved to actually follow the conversation. But yeah, the ENB just, you know, remains a, a wonderful source of information. So Radoslav, you've been to a number of negotiation sessions on environmental agreements, as you were just saying, and um, you teach students about the dynamics of these meetings through the use of in-class negotiation simulations. Uh, both Ryan and I do that in our classes too, uh, thanks in part to an article you wrote about UN simulations as a teaching tool a few years back. Uh, I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about the atmosphere of these meetings, how they work. Um, you know, they're, they're fascinating events that have thousands of people meeting in these large conference centers over, over days, sometimes weeks, to hammer out uh, these agreements. And when you first started going, what struck you as, as really interesting and exciting about how it all works? Well, there's a tremendous sense of elation uh, when you first begin attending these meetings because you see delegations from all over the world. You see the full panorama, you know, of cultures and the entire sort of political elite seems to be in one place. Occasionally, you see the mega climate conferences that always break the records in, in terms of the number of heads of states, for example, that attend those meetings. Um, I remember how excited we all were in Copenhagen 2009 when 119 kings, presidents, and prime ministers attended the conference and were in the same building uh, in, in one particular time. And, uh, and so it, you know, it's really um, you know, a tremendous experience because very often uh, these meetings do produce important decisions. And so you feel honored and privileged to be observing history in the making. At the same time, um, I think that it's important to remember that these conferences that get all the media attention are actually just the tip of the iceberg. You know, most of the uh, negotiations on any particular treaty take place during much smaller rounds of negotiations with exactly the same political delegations. You know, the chief negotiators are the same, except without the media, without the hype and fewer NGOs attending you know, more obscure meeting where actually much more gets done uh, in, in forging the text of the future treaty. Another thing to point out is that uh, people who do attend uh, any of those meetings are likely to actually remain blind as to what is truly happening. You know, the assumption is, you know, if there's a meeting in Bonn, Germany, and if we can go and we get even accreditation to get access to the meeting, somehow we'll go and see what climate negotiations really are. And that is simply not true and not possible because 
Uh, most people who attend, they receive the yellow badges of civil society. And civil society representatives are not really allowed in the rooms where the true negotiations take place. Um, they are allowed to the grand opening of the, of the session, the closing of the session, the so-called plenary meetings. Uh, but they are excluded from many of the working group sessions where the actual negotiations take place. And even if they are allowed, then they are not going to be able to attend the informal consultations that take place between any number of delegations, because China and the US, for example, could have bilateral consultations somewhere in a small room uh, with nobody having else having access. The European Union that I have represented very regularly holds consultations with island nations who are highly vulnerable to climate change because we sympathize with them. We try to be on the same page. Both the islands and the EU have always wanted strong climate treaties. But these negotiations that are informal and still important are, again, completely beyond the reach of any member of civil society. And so, unfortunately, what that means is that uh, in today's world, negotiations are not really transparent. The media doesn't help either because journalists have very superficial knowledge about the issues and they only arrive for a couple of days just to do their, you know, uh, little story. And it, it, it invariably ends up being much more superficial than what is actually happening among key countries. That, that's that been very helpful. And, and so I guess I want to go back to this uh, this idea of the uh, the mock negotiations that we do in our classrooms and that you do as well, um, because those are intended to simulate some of the real work as well, right? As, as we have our students, not just representing civil society, but also often representing state actors, negotiating among uh, one another to uh, write text for international agreements. Uh, I'm curious, when, when you do that kind of work with your students, what are you really hoping that they uh, take away from that simulation exercise about how these, uh, these negotiations happen? The simulations that I run in my courses um, are designed to be as realistic as possible because they constitute experiential learning. And my goal is to help the students learn through personal experience some of the hard political realities of the actual negotiations. One of the things, for instance, that um, they learn is that diplomats oftentimes do not have full information either about the problem or about what other countries want. I deliberately sort of designed uncertainty into the simulations. And that is important because this is how it works in the real world. Most diplomats live in, in sort of in some anxiety because they feel that most of the time they are in the dark about some very important aspects of the negotiations. Nobody has lucid vision and complete information. And it is important to be able to operate meaningfully despite the uncertainty. Um, the other thing is that time pressures um, are absolutely crucial for negotiations. What typically happens is many actors hold their cards close to the chest until the last days of the conference when they really put their demands on the table. Um, and some people are even lulled into complacency because oftentimes we you know, are on the last day of the conference and after two weeks, there is a, a solid text on the table ready for adoption. All the controversial issues have been solved. Uh, everybody's happy. They think that in two hours, you know, we can wrap up the conference and go back to go home. That is usually the time when you have to be alert the most because this is when the skillful diplomats pull out of the blue their key demands that surprise other delegations. But because it's the end of the conference, the time pressure makes it more likely that those demands will actually be met. Therefore, one has to be on, on one's toes all the time, especially towards the end of the negotiations. Also, um, students learn experientially that just, you know, as in the real world, in the simulations, those who win are not necessarily the big and important delegations like China or India or the European Union or the United States. 
the players that are influential are usually the ones who are the most initiative. Intellectual leadership matters a great deal in world politics. Um, and this is why we see small countries like Tuvalu being hyper influential in climate negotiations because um, they table entire a lot of proposals, they table entire treaty texts, and they say, we want this to be the basis of negotiations. Um, and any country can make text proposals, and then everybody else must discuss and address them. And in order for initiative to really be effective, uh, delegations have to be also very prepared. The reason why the United States, for example, is, is indeed very influential in global politics is not just because they have a big military, which is really irrelevant in, in environmental negotiations, or that they have a big economy, but because American delegations, in my experience, are invariably superbly prepared before they even arrive at the venue. There's so much homework going on uh, in the weeks and months before a round of negotiations. And American diplomats really know the issues inside out. They have looked at all the angles. They have strategized every possible political development that can take place. They know what their response is going to be. And so preparation plus initiative really is the formula for effectiveness. And that is comes as a surprise to many students. And they learn it partly through the simulations. This is really fantastic, uh, Radoslav. And, and I've also really enjoyed uh, teaching simulated environmental agreements. Um, and it's just, a, it's a wonderful experience I find for the students as well. And, and it's always the, those uh, simulations that the students talk about after the, the course is done, it's being the most uh, useful or effective learning tool. Uh, and, and so I echo uh, Peter's thanks for putting together some readings and documentation on that uh, to kind of close up the learning experience. Um, I, I want to shift a little bit, although it's not <laughs> too much of a shift actually, because You've come up with uh, some terms that I think are really important in this field. Um, and what, one of them is hollowness in terms of hollow agreements. And you've also conceived of the, of the idea of an empty institution, which I, I think are similar concepts. So maybe you can uh, touch on that. But I'm wondering if you can just define what a hollow agreement is or what is it that makes a multilateral environmental agreement hollow? Um, so this is a concept that I introduced uh, relatively recently to the study of global governance. Um, hollow agreements are documents that are negotiated by states that look like policy agreements, but in fact, they are designed deliberately to not do anything and not deliver any kind of policy output. Um, I have seen this happening a number of times from up close and personal. And one such example comes from the forestry negotiations. Now, students you know, should be aware that currently there is no international binding treaty on deforestation. Uh, in the 1990s, states negotiated very hard for 10 years. The negotiations failed. Canada was one of the absolute leaders in these negotiations, Canada and the European Union, wanted a strong binding treaty to protect the forests. The United States and Brazil formed a tandem that was the core of a coalition against a forest treaty. And most of the developing countries were also against in that coalition. And so after 10 years, the uh, negotiations were not going anywhere, time was running out, and the United States came up with a proposal, official proposal, I was there when they made it, they said, we need to um, establish a permanent international organization that is entirely dedicated to the forests. And of course, the statement was part of a very impressive monologue about the value of forests and the full American commitment to do everything possible to protect them. This is how you know, the US in particular always operates. So after basically working with Brazil to kill the prospect of any international treaty on forest, the U.S. said we need a permanent forum for non-binding discussions, and we want to call it a United Nations Forum on Forests. Everybody else was against this because um, nobody wanted non-binding discussions that were uh, unlikely to produce anything at all. 
to cut a very long story short, eventually everybody agreed to establish the United Nations Forum on Forests, which is now a permanent organization. And I was very privy to the negotiations of the key constitutional documents that gave the mandate to the new organizations. Uh, countries negotiated word by word what they will allow this new in international organization to do. And together, they made absolutely sure that the so-called UNFF cannot formulate forest policy. They cannot implement forest policy either you know, at any level, and they cannot fund anybody else's forest policy. So they really cooperate on eviscerating the institution and making absolutely certain that the UNFF could not possibly deliver anything at all. A similar story, you know, unfolded in the climate change negotiations in 2009, and the so-called Copenhagen Accord was another example of such an empty institution that was really designed to give the public the impression that states are doing something internationally and that they're agreeing on something. And mind you that the label, the Copenhagen Accord, is so grandiose that it can easily fool any concerned citizen uh, that governments have something in place. But in fact, what states had agreed in advance before the Copenhagen Conference is there was not going to be any kind of binding agreement that imposes obligations on anyone at all. And to take it now one important step further, not only these empty institutions or hollow agreements, which are, by the way, I use them synonymously, not only they are obviously ineffective because there's no policy in, in them whatsoever, more importantly, states use them to hide the failure of negotiations and to legitimize collective inaction on environmental problems. Because if the failure of negotiations resulted in no agreement whatsoever, the public would know it, NGOs would know it, and they would keep pushing governments to negotiate something in place. Given everything you've just said about empty agreements and uh, hollow institutions, what's your overall take on the Paris Accord? I know that you were involved in uh, negotiating it uh, with the EU delegation. It's a very different accord, for example, than the Kyoto Protocol, which had many more mechanisms and details. Uh, this one seems to have more ambitious targets for what it hopes to achieve, and yet uh, fewer mechanisms for doing that. What's your takeaway on what the Paris Accord is and whether we might expect it to achieve uh, what it says it will do? The Paris Agreement on Climate Change, negotiated in 2015, is one of the most complex international treaties ever negotiated in any issue area, and certainly the most complicated agreement on the environment. I do not say that in order to uh, escape the question, but the reality is that it is very difficult to categorize the agreement and evaluate it by labeling it and putting it inside a box because the treaty does not really fit the traditional model of international law. It has elements inside that are very binding on governments who do have to formulate climate policies, who do have to report their actions uh, and work towards uh, mitigating climate change. But at the same time, it gives them a great degree of freedom in formulating their domestic policies as they see fit because of this, the Paris Agreement has been criticized by some observers saying that, you know, it doesn't really impose any obligations. Governments can do whatever they want to do. And therefore, it's, a, it's sort of a fake uh, agreement. Uh, that is not true either, because the key provisions of the treaty oblige governments to formulate a specific policy and then every five years to reformulate the policy by making it more ambitious. And so one of the key provisions of the Paris Agreement is something that we in the European Union fought for very hard, is to put the so-called progression in the treaty or so the so-called ratcheting up mechanism. And we succeeded, and it is part of the treaty. And as a result of this, a country that joins the agreement becomes locked into a long-term policy process of accelerating ambition. 
right? So even if they start from a very unimpressive starting point, you know, with very weak policies in place, every five years they have to, uh, every government has to revise that plan upward and make it more ambitious. So it is an extremely complex political creature to analyze. And I think that that ironically is, enables some countries to use the Paris Agreement as an empty institution and as an excuse to have weak policies. So my take on this is that the Paris Agreement is not clearly an empty institution, the way I define them and describe them in other cases, because many actors seriously wanted strong policy and the Paris Agreement is just a result of an incredibly complicated political compromise uh, and a major achievement uh, in this long history of negotiations. But at the same time, the agreement could be used manipulatively by certain countries like Saudi Arabia or Russia as an excuse for weak domestic policies because the treaty does make it possible. Well, Radoslav, uh, you know, with the with that caveat of uh, the potential for it to be used uh, as a form of manipulation aside, we'll, we'll take the point of the Paris Agreement not necessarily being an empty institution as, as a, a perhaps a glimmer of hope for for that particular institution, which is, of course, uh, an, a very important one dealing with climate change. Um, we do have to leave the episode there and, and wrap it up. But I, I really want to thank you, Radoslav. It's been great chatting with you. And, you know, you've really helped us dig into the details of multilateral environmental agreements. Uh, we've talked about their challenges, their potential strengths, uh, albeit some, some fairly limited strengths on that front. Uh, and, you've, you know, you've also given us some really useful examples to explore. Um, and we've also appreciated your thoughts on, on the learning opportunities that are involved in simulated uh, environmental negotiations in the, in the classroom. So thank you. It's been great to have you. You're very welcome. It's been a real pleasure being here. Excellent. So I'll take us out now. Uh, just a quick reminder to our listeners, the podcast is made available under a Creative Commons License 2.0. So please share it and use it widely, but we just ask you provide uh, appropriate attribution. And follow us on Twitter. We're at EcopoliticsP, Ecopolitics with a capital P, or get in touch. Our website is at ecopoliticspodcast.ca. The Global Ecopolitics Podcast is produced by Nicole Bedford. Support with transcription and captioning is provided by Kika Mueller. And Adam Gibbard helps us with artistic design and digital support. Thanks again. We'll see you in our next episode.